Uh, thank you, Dylan, and thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to come and give these lectures, and thanks very much to Kayleigh for, and uh, Anna Souza also for all the help in, uh, in getting me here so comfortably. Um, so I'm going to give a, uh, today's lecture is a colloquium, and um, I'm talking to physicists, and um, I'm going to assume, or hope, that you are climate skeptics. Uh, and what I mean by this is that um, I want to take back the word skeptic um, to be an honorable word. Um, so skeptic has kind of been hijacked by sort of climate deniers, in a sense. Uh, and it's become a bad word. Uh, you know, oh, he's a climate skeptic. We can ignore him. Um, but I think we should all be skeptical, especially as physicists. And that's a little bit different from holding on to a preposterous theory or being a climate denier. So it's, it's, uh, it's good to be a skeptic. Um, so that's, and I will be talking about, let's see if this works, yep. um, what we know and what we don't know uh, about global warming, with, a, with sort of an emphasis on dynamics because dynamic is what, I, is what I do. In fact, for a long time, I never touched global warming. It was sort of too popular somehow. Or, and then I had a little bit of a revelation. Uh, just because something's important, that's not a reason to not do it. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it's fine. It's fine, actually, to do global warming. Respectable scientists can do global warming. Um, and um, so I'll start with sort of, so in this talk, I'll start with sort of well-known things which you all know about, I expect, and then move on to kind of more recondite things which you might not know about. So let's start with the easy stuff, um, the observed temperature record. Here's the observed temperature record, surface temperature. Um, it's gone up by about a degree Celsius now over the past century. Uh, fairly rapid warming here, then a bit of a hiatus in warming between about 45 and 75, then rapid warming. Another little hiatus until uh, last year or so, and now it started to warm again. And to put it in context, there are many, many pictures like this. Um, this is the temperature over about the past 2,000 years from a variety of sources, a lot of proxies. Uh, the instrumental record is just up here. Um, but you can see, although temperature certainly has varied over the past uh, 2,000 years, and when it was quite warm about 1,000 years ago, the warming that we've seen in the past uh, 50 or so years has really been unprecedented. Uh, and it's now warmer than it has been. It was probably about this warm, last time it was, this warm was about 100,000 years ago uh, in the last uh, interglacial. And I'm, cons and I'm concerned with what the effects of warming will be on the circulation. Um, but first, as I said, let's start with some easy stuff and ask, and again, this is a perfectly sensible question um, could the warming just have been natural variability? Um, not, not by any means a stupid question. And it could have been natural variability. And the most likely source of that uh, would have been the ocean because the atmosphere really doesn't have such long time scales. But the ocean has time scales of decades, hundreds of years, thousands of years. So a perfectly sensible hypothesis and the most likely hypothesis giving rise to natural variability would be that the ocean rearranged itself in some, in some fashion and gave up heat into the atmosphere. Uh, perfectly good hypothesis and that then it would have, the ocean would have cooled. So we can uh, test that hypothesis by looking at the temperature of the ocean. And lo and behold, Here's a measure of the ocean heat content. And here's the sea level rise, which is largely due 
to expansion due to um, the ocean getting warmer. And we see that the ocean, in fact, has gotten warmer uh, over the past 50 years, uh, and sea level has gone up. Um, so although it's, it's a perfectly sensible hypothesis not borne out by the observations, the ocean is not giving up heat to the atmosphere. Rather, the ocean is warming because of global warming. Um, and nor is the effect an effect due to uh, urban heat islands. I mean, another common, again, reasonable hypothesis. All our thermometers are in cities. Cities have gotten warmer. Um, but here are a couple loops. Oh, dear. Oh, I want to press that button again. <laughs> I probably will. Uh, but I'll try not to. <laughs> um, here's the, um, yeah, the lower troposphere the temperature, and there's a the surface temperature, and then more or less warmed in sync. Whereas if the warming were just due to an urban heat island effect because of surface warming um, with temperatures, with thermometers in cities, they wouldn't have warmed in sync. But they had more or less warmed in sync. So, and the urban heat island effect is, of course, you know, the first thing that a climate scientist would, would take into account. Um, so what's forcing, what's making it warmer? And the hypothesis that we all believe in um, is it's due to increased greenhouse gases. We've put a lot of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Simple, fairly simple radiative transfer arguments tell us that the atmosphere, that it will prevent infrared radiation from the surface uh, getting emitted to the atmosphere and thereby warm the atmosphere. And the, uh, we can actually calculate the, the forcing due to greenhouse gases um, with, with models. Uh, what do I mean by the forcing? Forcing is, if we want to know what, say, the forcing is to the double CO2, we, we take a model which has a radiative transfer code in it. We double the CO2 instantly, and, we, and that will reduce the amount of uh, radiation getting emitted from the, uh, the top of the atmosphere because it prevents radiation from the surface getting out of the atmosphere. And uh, if we double carbon dioxide, it turns out that the radiative forcing associated with that is about three and a half watts per square meter. We haven't doubled CO2 yet. This is a, um, this is a chart a map from 1900 to uh, the present day, more or less, of what that radiative forcing has been. And it's due to carbon dioxide, which is a, a methane. Um, and there's not too much uncertainty there. We know how much carbon dioxide has gone in. And we can calculate what the radiative forcing is due to that. They're both positive radiative forcings, warming the atmosphere. Um, and the gray curve here is our estimates of uncertainty in that forcing. If it were just carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we'd have much less uncertainty. But there's a large amount of uncertainty which comes from aerosols, just particulate matter in the atmosphere. And a lot of this uncertainty uh, is due to the presence of aerosols. Um, Different models have different aerosol formulations. And here's actually one estimate, and there are others, of the uncertainty due to the aerosol forcing. Aerosol forcing, by and large, is negative. It's cooling the atmosphere. Uh, but it has a large uncertainty. Um, slightly, slightly counterintuitive. The uncertainty is, is, of course, largest now. The uncertainty back in 1850 was zero because there, wa there wasn't any. We weren't putting anthropogenic aerosols in then, so we take that to be zero. Um, the aerosol forcing is negative, it's cooling the atmosphere, but there's quite a large amount of uncertainty um, in that. 
and that's where a lot of the uncertainty in the warming is. Um, and although this isn't the subject of, of my talk, climate sensitivity itself is somewhat uncertain, not as uncertain as some of the things I will talk about. Climate sensitivity is often defined as what would be the temperature response to a doubling in CO2. Rather interestingly, uh, the last generation of models, CMIP-5, Climate Modeling to Comparison Project 5, typically the climate sensitivity in those models was averaged around 3 degrees Kelvin. Rather oddly, sort of, it, it appears the latest generation of models, CMIP-6 models, which are just now, the results are just now appearing um, in the last uh, few months, they all seem to have a higher climate sensitivity of about 5 degrees. Uh, it's true of the Met Office model, NCAR model, and the GFDL model. I don't know about the others. Um, nobody quite knows what's going on, and uh, perhaps it will get sorted out, but at the moment it's not sorted out. Where this coming, it's probably coming from the aerosols, and uh, it perhaps should be said that Nobody actually believes this, that this five degree result is actually a true result. Uh, it does appear that the, the latest generation of models may be overestimating the climate sensitivity. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, so, so here's a slightly old plot now, I must say, of, the, of how various models do in predicting or in reproducing the past climate. Uh, this black line here is the observed climate from 1900 to 2000. And uh, the lighter gray shading around it um, represents the spread of all of the various models which have tried to reproduce that, and it's fairly small. Um, as we go into the future, these curves represent different emissions scenarios, depending on how much CO2 and other greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere. The models tend to do less well in the future than they've done in the past. So they tend to reproduce the past warming fairly well, um, partly because they're tuned to do so. Um, so if you get it wrong, you tune your model uh, to get it right. But then they all vary somewhat in the future. Um, but nonetheless, um, the uncertainty is not that large in the models, and they all are agreeing on the sign of the change. They're all getting warming. There's no uncertainty about that. Uh, and in fact, the difference in the emissions scenarios is larger than the uncertainty of what the warming will be for any particular scenario. Um, I've put an aside here, which I don't know the answer to, as to whether there's an irreducible limit uh, to the accuracy of our climate forecasts in the same way that there is the weather. But I will, I'll leave that as an open question. Uh, so today's thesis will be, in spite of the uncertainty about how much warming there will be, I want to say that there's an even larger uncertainty in how the atmosphere responds to that warming. So in other words, changes that involve the thermodynamics are, and radiation are robust. Changes that involve the dynamics, fluids, motion, etc., are less certain and perhaps less robust. And by robust, I mean, if you know the parameters in the forcing, you can calculate the response reasonably well. It's not immensely sensitive to a small change in parameters. Um, and a couple of tests for practical reasons, ways we could tell whether something is robust. If all the models give the same response, I mean, there are about 50 GCMs in the world, something like that, and if they're all giving the same answer, uh, then it's an indication that there's a robustness about the response. 
I mean, they might all, all, of course, all the model developers talk to each other, and they may all be making the same mistake. But nonetheless, um, if there is a consistency, it's a, it's, it's a measure of robustness. Secondly, if there's some underlying physical mechanism which we can understand uh, and that is not structurally unstable, not sensitive to parameters, then uh, that's also a sign of robustness. So if both of these are satisfied, I would call the uh, response robust. And um, I'm going to illustrate that the rest of the talk with two examples, one being the vertical structure of the atmosphere, mainly the height and temperature of the tropopores, uh, maybe stratospheric cooling if there's time. And I will argue that the response there is relatively robust. But once we get on to the latitudinal structure of the circulation, the expansion of the Hadley cell, the shift of the jet stream, and so on, that the response is, is less robust. And that's got very important consequence for things which actually matter on a human scale, um, things like the response of a regional climate, whether it will rain more in Ontario or, or, or whatever. Um, because oftentimes we, you know, GCMs have got fairly coarse resolution, um, you know, 50 kilometers grid scale, um, sometimes larger. Um, and we often try and downscale, if you will. So we uh, take the output of a large scale model and we downscale it using a higher resolution regional scale model to get to predict what is happening on a more local scale. Um, but if you've got the large scale wrong to begin with, your downscaling isn't going to help you at all. You know, it will be a sort of garbage in, garbage out uh, scenario. So I say here, uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't downscale, but we have to be careful that a lot, lot of the error, downscaling is useless if, if the large scale circulation uh, is incorrect. So regional climate change, um, I would argue, is actually a problem in the global circulation. Uh, you have to get that right, and then you can downscale and, and get all the small scale uh, stuff right. OK, so let me show you now a plot of the temperature change. It's an average of many models. Um, height up here, latitude here. This is a temperature uh, trend, uh, and I can't exactly remember the details, but it's sometime in the future minus the, the, the present day. Um, and red is warmer, blue is colder, and what we see are, is that by and large, the entire troposphere, the lower part of the atmosphere has warmed. It's especially warmed here and here. Uh, so it's warmed at the um, at low latitudes high up, uh, and it's warmed at high latitudes low down. This is, this is often referred to as polar amplification, uh, but there's just as much or more amplification at low latitudes uh, high up. And um, I don't fully understand this, but I understand where this is coming from. And that's coming from a change in the, um, the so-called lapse rate. If we, if we warm the atmosphere, uh, there's going to be more moisture in the atmosphere. If there's more moisture in the atmosphere, that change is the nature of the convection. It's the convection which determines what the lapse rate is, i.e. how much the temperature is falling off with latitude. And um, in a warmer atmosphere, there's more moisture. The lapse rate actually decreases so that it doesn't, temperature does not fall off as much uh, with height 
And so any warming is amplified because the temperature is not falling off as much uh, with height. Um, and here's, here is how actually the lapse rate varies with temperature as it gets warmer, the lapse rate falls. Uh, here's an expression for it, but we don't need to uh, really know what it is, just that the lapse rate falls uh, with temperature. And it only really has an effect here because it's only in low latitudes. It's only in the tropics where the lapse rate is actually determined by moist convection. Um, so we're getting, so that's a robust response. Um, nearly every single model uh, in the world gives you a response like this. Um, and we know what the mechanism is. Um, so we're, we're pretty confident about that. The other thing, which is interesting, is that this is, this black line and the red line is a, of a tropopause. Um, so this is the tropopause now, this is the tropopause sometime in the future, and the tropopause has gone up. It's risen. Um, seems a strange thing. Is that a robust response? Well, let me just remind you what the tropopause is if you're not an atmospheric scientist. Um, this is the, well, here's actually the observed temperature over the globe. And in various places, the global average, the tropics, the exotropics. But everywhere, the temperature falls fairly rapidly. It's this lapse rate that I mentioned, up to a height of roughly 10 kilometers, depending on where you are. And then it falls off much less rapidly with height. And this break here is the tropopause. Um, and here is, I love showing this because uh, the United States has standardized the atmosphere. <laughs> and this is the U.S. standard atmosphere, as if, you know, like a pint or a, uh, <laughs> you know, a yard. It's the U.S. standard yard. So this is the U.S. standard atmosphere. Um, and uh, so here's the troposphere up to 10 kilometers. And the temperature's fairly constant, and it actually increases and falls off. Uh, it's increasing up here, largely because of ozone absorption. But even without ozone absorption, there would be a tropopause. The temperature would just more or less uh, go up uniformly. And, uh, and here are the observations. Here actually is the, this kind of blue dotted one is the tropical um, profile here. Interestingly enough, the tropical tropopause is higher than anywhere else, and it's, and it's cooler than anywhere else. And here is the, the tropopause as a function of latitude, the height of the tropopause, about eight or nine kilometers at high latitudes, about 16 at low latitudes. Um, and here's the temperature of the tropopause, and it's actually as I mentioned, colder, which is slightly counterintuitive, that the tropopause is colder in, um, in high latitude. And I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. And I think we understand, we understand that too. And what's happened to the tropopause? Uh, here's the, basically the picture I showed again. But here are the trends in meters per decade of the increase in tropopause height as a function of latitude. And each one of these thin gray lines is a model, one of the IPCC models. And the thick, dark, thick line is the average of the models. And in every single model, the tropopause height is increasing. Uh, there's no exceptions to that. Uh, and the rate of increase, by and large, is larger than the spread of the models. Uh, and it's actually increasing at, an, at a fair rate. 
I mean, it's, it's getting on for 100 meters per decade. Uh, and that's certainly got societal impacts. Um, so if the tropopause goes up half a kilometer, planes which want to fly, for example, in the lower stratosphere have to fly a little bit higher, uh, which will cost a lot of, potentially, have a large economic impact. So why is there a trop why is there why is there a tropopause? Let's let's get that right to begin with. Let's understand that. And um, well, here's a few equations, but you don't need to follow the equations, um, which I will try and have my philosophy for the entire week. So I'll put equations on the board, but I'll try and explain them in words so you don't actually need to follow them. Or you, you just trust me, OK? Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, OK, here's the equations of radiative transfer, which have been known for donkey's years. U for upwards radiation, B for D for down. So the upwards radiation it's variation with tau, which is proportional to the optical depth, or which in turn is proportional to the distance, is u minus b. Uh, and b, um, in the simplest model of radiative transfer, is just sigma t to the fourth. If it's, if it's gray, and spectroscopists don't like to think of the atmosphere as being gray, uh, they're turning gray at the notion that, the atmosphere, that I'm thinking of the atmosphere as gray. But let's just, first, let's just not worry about that. Uh, for the moment, it doesn't make a qualitative difference. And if there's just radiation, the, atm the atmosphere goes into radiative equilibrium. So here's height and here's temperature. And then you get various temperature profiles like this. Um, we depend upon the the optical depth of the atmosphere. Uh, so if we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, for example, we increase the optical depth. So this purple line up here has got a large optical depth. Uh, and so the surface temperature is, is very large. If the optical depth diminishes, surface temperature diminishes. The atmosphere is completely transparent temperature is uniform. And this is the greenhouse effect. This is the greenhouse effect. So if there were nothing else going on in the atmosphere at all, we'd have a profile like this. And the radiation, the temperature at the top, what's that determined by? That's determined by um, how much radiation we emit to space. And in radiative balance, that's the same as the incoming solar radiation. The outgoing infrared has to equal the incoming solar radiation if you're in balance. So uh, all of these have the same outgoing radiation. And the outgoing radiation, that, that gives a temperature, actually, if you, if you do the calculation. The temperature of the stratosphere is given by this. The outgoing long wave radiation is 2 times sigma times 2 to the fourth. Uh, calculation um, shows us that. So then how do we get a, how do we get a tropopause? Uh, well, here's the radiative equilibrium temperature, this blue dashed line. That's going to be unstable. It's going to be convectively unstable. It's going to get convection. It's going to move it to a, a lapse rate, which is neutrally stable. So it's going to move it to this line here. Um, and it's going to, temperature is going to adjust in an approximate way so that the area, the convection is neither creating energy nor destroying energy, so it's like an equal area construction. So that gives us where this intercept is. So then we follow this up until it hits here, and then it goes straight up, because then the, the outgoing long wave radiation has got to be determined by the incoming solar radiation in equilibrium. Uh, so that gives us the height of the tropopause. And if you do the calculation, you get about 10 kilometers. So then what happens with global warming? 
Well, here's just the same, same picture. Um, there will be a certain height of the tropopause, which gives us the correct amount of outgoing radiation. That's what determines the tropopause height. But maybe just look at the right-hand plot. This blue line is, say, today's temperature, the tropopause here, uh, in a stratosphere in radiative equilibrium. We put greenhouse gases in, it warms, it's a greenhouse effect. But the tropopause temperature has to remain the same because you have to get the same amount of outgoing long wave radiation because the incoming long wave radiation is still the same. So, it, so to get the same tropopause temperature, uh, the, the tropopause has to be higher. And there's almost, there's no way around that argument. Um, it's a very robust argument, and we can make it more complicated by making the atmosphere non-gray. Uh, but you're still going to get the same result that the tropopause height increases. And, um, oops. and furthermore, that this tropopause height increasing is actually further amplified by the fact that the lapse rate increases because we're going to a moist adiabatic lapse rate uh, with a warmer temperature, with a warmer overall temperature, the temperature falls off less rapidly with height. So we have before, the red dash line is afterwards with the same lapse rate, and then it's amplified even more because the lapse rate is lower. Uh, and uh, and if, you, if you do the calculation, uh, what you end up with uh, is that the height of the tropopause will actually increase by about 300 meters for each degree of warming, uh, which is actually uh, not inconsiderable. Uh, it's certainly measurable. And if we actually then look at how the various models, all of these models in the IPCC report, they all predict somewhat different tropopause height increases. Um, so what I've plotted here is that tropopause height change in meters of all the various models against how much these models are warming. And the models which are warming more have a greater increase in tropopause height. It's almost a straight line here. And it's about, as the calculation suggests, about 300 meters uh, per degree uh, warming. So, uh, so all the models are giving it. Um, we understand why. And the models which are warming more are giving you a larger um, tropopause height. Um, we can do a little bit more, but I, I don't want to go into it too much, but I will just say that we can actually solve these radiative transfer equations um, and, oops, do this calculation for where the tropopause height should be. Um, and I won't go through the calculation, but we can end up with an analytic prediction for how high the tropopause should be based on all the various parameters in the problem, including the, the lapse rate here. Um, gamma is what the lapse rate is. Tau here is the optical depth, and so on. And we can see if we can actually fit the observations with this analytic expression for how the lapse rate how the tropopause height varies with latitude. And it's a slightly messy graph, but if you follow my pointer, it goes up, along, and down. So we actually now have, a, if you will, an analytic expression or a theory um, for the tropopause height as a function of latitude. And we can also use this theory to 
predict, in a way, how much each model should, how much the tropopause height should change in each model in the CMIP-5 uh, ensemble. And here are our predictions. And this is what each model predicts. So our analytic theory, um, of course, we can't test it against observations because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, but at least the analytic model is predicting uh, what each individual general circulation model, how its tropopause height uh, should increase. Um, and perhaps one other little, one other little addition, sort of for the professionals, if you will, is that um, my earlier plot, we said that the tropical tropopause height is actually higher and colder than anywhere else in the atmosphere. And that's rather hard to explain. Um, it should be higher, but why it should be colder is, um, is another question. But we can extend our theory, and I'll talk perhaps a little bit more about this in the later lectures, um, by adding the effects of a Brewer-Dobson circulation in the, in, the, uh, in the tropical stratosphere, the Brewer-Dobson circulation is acting really to cool the stratosphere. And if we add that effect into our theory, um, well, here's what we predict for the tropical uh, profile with a, with a prediction of the tropical tropopause here, mid-latitude tropopause here, and this is what observations tell us. So we can actually now predict that the, the height of the, um, of the tropical tropopause. The temperature is a little bit of a, and here's where we get into a little bit more radiative transfer. The tropical, I'm sorry, the, the, we assumed when we did this calculation that the temperature of the tropopause actually stayed fixed because that determined what the outgoing radiation was. Turns out, and again, a slightly technical point, that that's only true for a gray atmosphere. And this is actually what the temperature of the tropopause does in all of these various uh, global warming models. And it actually increases uh, by about half a degree on average, which, which is actually quite a bit less than the surface warming. Here's the surface warming, which is about three degrees. But nonetheless, the tropopause is increasing in temperature and it turns out we can extend the theory a little bit by including non-gray effects of radiative transfer and including a window. There's a, a large amount of radiation just escapes straight through the atmosphere, uh, through the infrared window, um, and straight out to space. As we add um, carbon dioxide and as we which in turn adds water vapor because the atmosphere is warming. The window closes up a little bit. If the window closes up a little bit and we redo the calculation with a window, it turns out that the tropopause temperature will actually increase. Um, and here's a calculation that we did with our theory. Just look at this bottom right-hand picture. This is before, this is the temperature profile, it goes up to the tropopause, then it goes up, or the temperature falls off less rapidly in the stratosphere. With warming, both the height of the tropopause increase, as does the temperature. Uh, and that's a very robust result. We can't get around it. Um, no matter if we add a million lines to our calculation, 
it's still going to give the same thing. Now let's turn a little bit to dynamics. Um, and this is the Hadley sum. This is the, this is just, unless you're a professional dynamicist, just look at the left-hand picture. And this is the Hadley cell um, in winter. This is the Hadley cell in summer. These are the feral cells on either side. So the, so the atmosphere is going round. The air is rising at the equator, moving polewards and sinking at about 30 degrees north. Why does it sink? We have theories for that. Um, and, well, just look at the bottom figure here. Um, air goes at the equator, higher latitudes here, it's warmest here, so the air rises, warm air rises. The only thing you need to know about convection, warm air rises till it hits the tropopause and it moves polewards. Um, and then it sinks. Uh, why does it sink? Why doesn't it go all the way to the, to the pole? It can't go all the way to the pole because for the reasons here, this air, as it moves polewards, starting here, moving polewards, it's coming closer to the axis of rotation. If the air, because it's, the axis of rotation is here, where the Earth is. We've got a ring of air going around the globe. If it's moving its polewards, it's getting closer to the axis of rotation. If it conserves its angular momentum, it has to spin faster. So it has to go around faster. So its velocity has to increase, and it will actually increase quite rapidly if it, uh, if it conserves its angular momentum. And then, because of one of the most basic laws of meteorology, the thermal wind, if the velocity is increasing as it goes from here to here, the temperature must fall as it goes from here to here. That's called thermal wind equation. And this is how the temperature falls. It's, it's this expression here. But it falls quite rapidly. And essentially, why does, the, why does the air sink? It sinks It sinks because it gets so cold it has to sink. And if you do the calculation, it turns out that it sinks at about 30 degrees, 25 degrees north. Um, and uh, we get a little formula for it here for the width of the Hadley cell. And, uh, and lo and behold, it's got an H in it. So an increase in the height of the Hadley cell suggests, I'm so, sorry, an increase in the height of the tropopause, H, if H goes up, the extent of the Hadley cell must expand. The Hadley cell must expand. So it's a very robust result that the tropopause height increases. Um, Therefore, it's a prediction that the Hadley cell should expand. Uh, and um, that's great. OK. Therefore, we have a theory for how the Hadley cell expands. But then it turns out it's not quite as simple as this. Because uh, here, what I'm plotting is this is wind. Portion it's not labeled against latitude. This dashed blue line here is how the wind increases if it's conserving the angular momentum. Eventually, the wind becomes so strong that it crosses a threshold to become unstable. Uh, and this instability is baroclinic instability, it's essentially the instability. If, which is the instability which gives us weather, essentially. Uh, so the Hadley cell can't go any beyond this because it will be unstable. But this is actually going to be, whoops, let me 
in London, is actually going to be a different latitude than this. No reason why they should be the same. Um, and there's actually other theories for what determines the extent of the Hadley cell. It's, um, another theory essentially says that, well, most of the instability actually is occurring in mid-latitudes. It's sending Rosby waves into the low latitudes. These waves are breaking. Uh, they're interacting with the Hadley cell. They're causing the Hadley cell to sink. Um, so that's another theory, if you will, uh, which I don't want to go into for the width of the, of the Hadley cell. And um, so this sort of becomes the nature, a little bit of dynamics, is that um, we, we kind of have, we don't have an, a good theory for what's going on. And it's as, if, it's as if all the models know that we don't have a good theory. So they all choose to behave in different ways. Uh, the models are aware of our uncertainty, if you will, uh, and say, ah, you don't know what's going on. I'll confound you. So here, what I'm plotting here is the Hadley cell expansion. Now, they all, the Hadley cell, in, in a bunch of global warming experiments, the Hadley cell expands. Um, each dot is a model. Uh, this is the northern hemisphere, this is the southern hemisphere. And actually, you think, okay, that's not so bad, really. Uh, because, say, especially in the northern hemisphere, all the models are expanding by about the same, by the, about the same amount. There's more spread here. But the, the slightly confounding thing is that what I'm plotting here is how much the models, each individual model has warmed by what its climate sensitivity is. So in the northern, you would, we would naturally expect that the Hadley cell would expand more in models that warm more. But that ain't so. Uh, so, um, and, and furthermore, there is obviously a lot of spread, especially in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and that spread is, is important. I mean, if the Hadley cell expands, you know, where the air is descending uh, in the Hadley cell, that's deserts, it's dry. If the Hadley cell is expanding, it potentially means the deserts are expanding. Uh, causing migrations of, potentially migrations of population and so on. Uh, the observations are actually not very clear on this either. Um, in the southern hemisphere, this caused a lot of, quite a bit of upset in the literature. Uh, there's some people were arguing that the Hadley cell had already expanded by five degrees. Um, which turns out to be not really the case. These are, but these are various measures of the Hadley cell expand, expanding. And we have seen a little bit of expansion of the Hadley cell, but we really don't know how much it is going to expand. And we don't really have a good sense of what the controlling factors are in any quantitative fashion. Uh, for the expansion of the Hadley cell. Um, Mid-latitudes are potentially a still harder problem um, because the atmospheric mid-latitude circulation is, is it's essentially a problem in turbulence of a kind, of large-scale turbulence or weak turbulence at least. Uh, and a, again, a small shift in the surface winds is, is what I mentioned at the beginning. A small shift in the surface winds uh, can have quite large effects on, on mid-latitudes. Uh, if the winds shift by about two degrees, that's similar to the difference in London and Paris and 
People often say springtime in Paris, but nobody ever says springtime in London. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, um, turns out that the surface wind is more or less proportional to the convergence of eddy momentum flux. Uh, so how much momentum the eddies are bringing into middle attitudes. Um, we don't really have a theory for, thi for this either. And in fact, if we look here at the shift in the surface westerlies of all of these various models, um, southern hemisphere is circles, northern hemisphere is dashed lines and squares. Um, and here it is in winter. And you can see, and that, uh, this is, this is what I call an annoying result because nearly all of the models predict that the, um, that the jet, the middle latitude westerlies will shift polewards. But they all predict it by uh, different amounts and the spread, well, you can see is enormous. The spread is far larger than the shift itself. So they all seem to be predicting that it will shift, but they're all predicting by rather different amounts. Um, so that's a rather, as I say, that's a rather annoying result. And well, we'll have to wait and see whether this, these um, results are any better with the new generation of models, which is just uh, just now appearing. And um, oh, and here, just to continue the theme. This shows what the shift is as a function of the temperature increase of the various models. And again, there's not a lot of correlation. The temperature, the shifts in the westerlies are, are sort of all over the place. And um, it does appear um, if we look here, this is the, sh for example, this is the shift in the westerlies. This is the shift, the expansion of the Hadley cell. So there is clearly a correlation between the expansion of the Hadley cell and the shift of the westerlies. Uh, so models which predict an expansion of the Hadley cell do predict uh, a shift in the westerlies. Uh, but as to why, uh, I think it's fair to say we don't. Well, I was going to say we don't have a theory for it. It's not quite true. There are. If we look in the literature, there are about six different theories for the shift in the westerlies. And um, people say, people say, oh, only one of them can be right. And I kind of disagree slightly with that. They could all be right in a way, but they're all acting in slightly different ways in different models. Um, and, uh, and here's a plot of how the... Um, well, let, me, let me move on to the, the strength, change in strength of the, of the winds. And again, well, there's some suggestion that in th the southern hemisphere summer, the surface winds get weaker with global warming. Uh, but in northern hemisphere, they get stronger. Uh, that this may be or is likely to do with the fact that the polar amplification is happening mainly in the northern hemisphere rather than the, uh, the southern hemisphere. So, as I say, there's all sorts of possibilities as to why this could happen. And uh, I kind of, almost my last slide is that perhaps it's not surprising, and this comes back to You know, how, whether it's even possible to, act, to predict exactly how much the jets will shift because of all the nonlinearities in the system. I mean, it's a schematic, here's the equator, here's the pole, here's the Hadley cell, gives you a subtropical jet here. There's another jet stream here, which is the classical jet stream, which meanders uh, around mid-latitudes. 
the polar vortex, which we keep hearing about in the news, I guess, every winter these days, the polar vortex is doing something, um, um, which is interacting with and is, in a sense, part of the eddy-driven jet and the subtropical jet. They're all interacting. They've all got different dynamics. Uh, furthermore, they're all affected by the brewer dobson circulation. The brewer dobson circulation is driven by waves going up from the tropical sphere up into the stratosphere, uh, which is affecting the polar vortex. So you've got a myriad of nonlinear interactions. And although the models, in some sense, can resolve these nonlinear interactions, uh, it appears that they are quite sensitive to model parameters, and they act in, uh, in different ways. So, um, so I guess just to conclude, what I'm saying really is that, or I'm arguing, the thermodynamic changes and radiative changes, they have uncertainties, because we still don't know what the climate sensitivity is. Uh, but at least we know the sign of the change. We know that it's going to get warmer. Um, and although I didn't talk about it, another robust change is going to be sea ice loss. Uh, we have been and will likely continue to lose sea ice uh, in the Arctic. Uh, that's fairly robust. Um, and as I argue that increase in height of the tropopores and the cooling of the stratosphere, which I didn't talk about, but uh, th there are solid physical mechanisms and they're reproduced by models. But the dynamical consequences of some of these changes are less well known. Um, Hadley cell expansion, it's likely to happen, but the scatter in the model is extremely large. Uh, another one is we really don't know what the effects of sea ice loss will be on middle latitudes. Uh, because although there's polar amplification associated, in part associated with sea ice loss, um, polar amplification is only at the surface. If we go higher up in the atmosphere, it's warmed more in the tropics. So it's a, it's a rather complicated, uh, um, a rather complicated situation. And so I guess the final thing to say is that it's, it's these dynamical changes which bring about changes in regional climate. And that's why I think um, changes in regional climate and the weather are more uncertain than we would like them to be. Uh, and uh, as well as the consequences of sea ice loss, things like the changes in precipitation over land, storm track changes, and so on, uh, those things are, are more uncertain than we would like them to be. So I will stop and thank you for, uh, for listening.